Bible says, enter his gates with thanksgiving and come into his courts with praise. Let's clap our hands. His gates with thanksgiving, come to his courts with praise. Enter his presence rejoicing, singing great and mighty is his name. Praise with the sound of the trumpet, praise with the timbrel and harp. In heaven, let the sound of praise sing with all their heart. For the Lord is good. 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 And His mercy endures forever. For the Lord is good. For the Lord. Mercy endures forever and ever and ever. That is that those two lines have been the source of great comfort, hope, strength for people down the ages. They kept singing. In every battle they would face, the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. Why will I be okay tomorrow? For the Lord is good, his mercy endures forever. How will I overcome this challenge? The Lord is good in His mercy. We don't live life based on our good works, our merit, what we deserve and so on. No, no, no. We deserve life based, we, we live life based on the character of God, the nature of God. He is good and He does good. He shows us mercy and He keeps on showing mercy and He never runs out in terms of His mercy. His mercy will never ever run out. 
this next song talks about how God has already given us the victory he causes us always everybody say always always to triumph no matter what is in happening in your life i want to tell you my friend it's not over until you win the game until you win the fight until you win the battle it's not over the game is not over until you win because god is fighting for us god is giving us victory and the guarantee of our victory is the resurrection of our lord jesus christ oh these are all great truths that you know but remind yourself once more today as we sing and thank god for the victory he gives us in jesus name
over God. Oh, praise be to God. We have overcome. We have overcome. It's as good as done. It's as good as done. The future is like the past when it comes to God. That's why he says, I have given you this land, even though he's still yet to give, you know, the people of Israel. The beginning of the book of Deuteronomy, he says, I have given you. That's it. It's as good as done. Oh, your victory is as good as done. It's like the past tense. Your future victory is the past tense for God. We believe it's already done. It's already done. And this next song reminds us of the resurrection of Christ. That the power of the risen Christ is in us. That same power which raised Jesus from the dead is dwelling in us. Yeah. 
Thank you, Lord, for you are risen from the dead. You are alive. You are alive. You are alive. Oh, help us to sense the reality of that. Help us to appreciate the greatness of the fact that you are alive forevermore. That you have conquered everything that was put before you. Sin, sickness, curse, death itself. By your death, you defeat it. and you rose again to be king of kings and lord of lords and to live and rule and reign forever and ever and you have raised us up those of us who believe in you you have raised us up spiritually already and you've made us to sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus you're already causing us to rule and reign oh help us to rule and reign with you more and more help us oh god to see you ruling and reigning and to follow help us to live out our mandate we praise you jesus Throned in the Father's love Destined to die Poured out for all mankind God's only Son Perfect and spotless one never sin suffered as if he did all at once every victory is your Worthy of honor and 
awesome and powerful ever. Awesome and great is your name. Jesus in this place, for he has overcome. He's worthy of glory and honor, but he's awesome in power, awesome in authority, in glory today, seated at the right hand of God. 
filled with glory and splendor. Oh Lord, help us to see you as the risen and exalted Lord Jesus. May the Spirit of God open our eyes that we may see you, your beauty, your majesty, your glory. May the Spirit of God make Jesus and his presence right now with us real to us. Oh, help us to sense your presence. Oh, my, my friend, take this opportunity. To exalt Jesus. He's in our midst. And he's receiving our praise. He's receiving our praise. Oh we praise you Jesus. We exalt you Jesus. We lift you Jesus. Help us. To sense your presence in our midst. Pour out your spirit. In our midst. In abundance. Pour out your spirit. Forgive us for not having eyes to see many times, years to year, to perceive you as the risen Lord, risen Savior. Oh, help us not to just in our minds be aware that you are risen, but oh Lord, may your risen presence be real to us. Show us your glory, oh Lord, like Moses we says, we say. Show us a bit of your glory. Help us to see you high and lifted up. May the Spirit of God help us to do that. We pray for more and more of your Holy Spirit to be poured out in our midst so that our eyes will be opened, our ears will be opened, our minds can perceive. Even during this time, we pray that you'll prepare our hearts to receive your word, O Lord, that you will help us to hear your voice as we hear the man of God preach. Help us to hear, help us to understand, help us to receive with humility and help us to believe and apply what we hear in our lives, O God. May the Spirit of God help us to do that. May the Holy Spirit anoint your servant mightily that he may speak the word of God clearly and boldly that people's lives may be changed, that people may be set free, transformed, strengthened, uplifted, encouraged, set on a new path today by the power of your word. We come at the rest of this service into your mighty hands. May Jesus be exalted in our midst. May your kingdom come more and more, your will be done more and more, even during this service. We come it into your mighty hands. We thank you. We praise you. We give you all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's continue to worship God by giving our tithes and offerings. Please get your offerings ready. And as you're doing that, let me remind you that apart from cash, there's all kinds of ways to give. You can give through a check or demand draft or money order in favor of Victory Christian Foundation as you see up there. You can also go to our website refsam.org and click on our online giving link and follow instructions and give. You can also give through credit card or debit card. All cards are accepted. We have swiping machines in our bookstore right now. They'll be there at the end of the service for your convenience. Let's all say this before we give. Get your offering together. Let's say this. Jesus said, Give, and it shall be given back to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall men pour into your bosom. I believe what Jesus said. Lord, you are my source. I look up to you. I depend on you, so I give to you. Amen. As you are giving, we want to welcome newcomers in our midst. If you are here for the first time in our church, would you please raise your hand? If you're here for the first time in our church, please raise your hand. Kindly keep your hand raised until you receive a brochure from our ushers. After you receive that brochure, you may put your hand down. If you look inside that brochure, you'll find a white card. We want you to fill that out with your name and other details. After this service ends, we want you to take that white card outside to the newcomer's desk. Just hand it over to them. They'll give you a free CD and a free magazine. On behalf of Pastor Sam and the entire AFT family, I take this opportunity to welcome you to our church. And uh, we do hope that you will continue to come and experience for yourself the wonderful things that God is doing in and through our church. Before we go to the word of God, let me remind the children from UKG to 8th standard. We have children's church happening in this building right now. And uh, 
the only reason a child should be here is if they are actually listening and following the message otherwise they shouldn't be here they should be there all right thank you before we get to the word of god let me uh take a moment to pray for young people who are going to appear for the plus 2 examination somebody told me that they're going to have examination starting on the second right so if you're here and if you're appearing for plus 2 examinations would you please stand wherever you are and we will just pray for you inside or outside wherever we prayed for a lot of children in the first two services and uh, we want to pray for the children here in this service also loving heavenly father in the name of jesus we come father we thank you lord for these young people they are yours we pray especially during this examination time for them that you will give them wisdom and understanding and knowledge uh, i pray that you will help them and aid them in their studies that even the things that are difficult will become easier for them by the help of god i pray that they will depend on you as the one who strengthens them gives them the wisdom of god you have a great plan for them and a purpose for them and i pray that you will reveal to them your plan your purpose the gifts and abilities that are placed in them will be revealed to them guide them in a clear path to know what they should do in their life give them a clear vision a wonderful vision in their hearts let them walk and follow this vision may they not live aimlessly and purposelessly may they study with a great desire and a eagerness to see god manifest himself in their lives and to use them in a mighty way in whatever field of endeavor that they will enter into tomorrow we bless them in your mighty name that they will succeed not only in this exam uh, but also in life itself we bless them in your mighty name in jesus name we pray amen all right please turn with me to 1 corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7 1 corinthians chapter 5 verse 7 and also exodus chapter 12 exodus chapter 12 and uh, verse 13 1 corinthians 5 7 and exodus 12 verse 13 first i'll read 1 corinthians 5 7 therefore purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump since you truly are unleavened for indeed Christ our passover was sacrificed for us exodus chapter 12 verse 13 now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are and when i see the blood i will pass over you and the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when i strike the land of egypt begun new series 3 weeks ago this is the fourth week studying about the power of the blood of Jesus and the last week i started talking about the passover which is a major event really it's as important in the new testament as the life of christ and the death and the resurrection of christ as important as that is to the new testament to the old testament this event of the passover is so it's a major event major event in the sense that there's a lot of revelation concerning salvation given there in the passover event now those who have born been born and raised like me in a christian home and gone to church and heard a lot of preaching uh, must have heard a lot about these things and are familiar with the passover event but i'm sure there are those that are new to this new to christ new to the whole bible and uh, the old testament passages may appear like very old to some people here So I want to explain certain things very basically before I really get into it for a second time I want to deal with the Passover today because there's so many things that it reveals about God's wonderful plan of salvation. So let me explain certain things basically to you. <coughs> Now God uh came down to deliver the people of Israel after 400 years of them being in bondage in the land of Egypt. You know how they came to Egypt they came as children of Jacob in Jacob's time Joseph came ahead of them and uh, became the great leader of Egypt who saved the whole land from a famine 
and rose to the position of something like a prime minister in those days in this foreign land. God exalted him and elevated him to that position. And uh, Joseph was greatly honored by the Pharaoh of that time. His father and his brothers came as a whole family. Seventy of them came and settled in Egypt at that time. They were very comfortable. They were given a, one of the best areas of the land to occupy and to work. And uh, they prospered very much. As the Bible says in the first chapter of Exodus that uh, they became great in number. They, uh, number is strength in those days. So they became great in number, increased as a family. And their wealth increased. Everything they put their hands to do succeeded. And uh, after Joseph's time, the trouble started. They became, the people became jealous, looking at their prosperity, looking at their success, and looking at the increase in numbers. They wanted to curtail everything. They wanted to make sure that these foreigners do not really overtake them. So they were really oppressed in that nation. Uh, things reached a point where they became slaves and uh, became poor, became very troubled and distressed. And in their great distress, they cried out to God and God came to deliver them. Now, God came to deliver them because they are already in a covenant. If you remember, God made a covenant with Abraham. And God even prophetically spoke about their journey to Egypt. And uh, the fact that they will spend 400 years there was already known to God and God revealed it to Abraham in Abraham's days. I want to read that passage because some of you may not be very familiar with that. Please turn with me to Genesis chapter 15. In chapter 15 begins with Abraham going to God and literally appealing to God saying that he doesn't have a child, he has everything, he has wealth, he has a status in society but does not have a child. He's worried that his servants' children will become heirs to all the wealth that he has. So he tells God in so many words that his servants' children are going to inherit all his wealth. But God tells him, no, someone who is born to you will be your heir. You will have a child. This child will be born through you and only that person will inherit everything. And so God says, look at the stars of the sky. Can you count them, number them? And uh, God says, I will make your seed like the stars of heaven. That's a wonderful, amazing promise. But then on top of that, God promises him a land. In verse 7, chapter 15, verse 7, in the first six verses, the promise of a child, descendants, like the stars of heaven. Then in seventh verse, he says, I am the Lord who brought you out of the Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? Now, what guarantee is there that I will get a land? This is too much of a promise. A whole land is going to be given. He says, how will I know? And so God, and he said, Lord God, how shall I know that I'll inherit it? Verse 9. So he said to him, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Now, they're already used to sacrifices. If you remember the coats of skin incidents in the Garden of Eden, taught them for the first time about sacrifice. That shame and fear that came as a result of sin can be covered properly, not through fig leaves, which were man-made clothes, but God made clothes, which is coats of skin. But the coats of skin came as a result of killing an animal, killing probably a lamb, and taking the skin out of the lamb. God clothed Adam and Eve and taught them the lesson that sin can be properly remedied only through his way, not through their way. All human religions of this world are the fig leaves type of attempt to cover the problem of sin and to find a remedy for the problem that sin has brought into their lives. But only God can come up with a solution, a proper solution. It was taught to them and thereafter they started bringing sacrifices Understanding that when you come to God, you know, normally you'll have to hide and be in a fear of God. That's why Adam went and hid. But then after this coat of skin incidents, they learned that God clothes us uh, in his way. And we can come and stand before God only as a result of the giving of a life and shedding of a blood. Only in that way we can be worthy to stand before God. Because the soul, soul that sin shall die 
and the wages of sin is death, they recognized that, they recognized what sacrifices meant. Thereafter they started sacrificing. Abel sacrificed, Noah sacrificed, all of these people sacrificed and you read about that. So by the time they come to Abraham, now here, uh, God is introducing Abraham to the idea of sacrifices. And so God tells him to bring uh, these animals and birds and so on. And then he brought all these things to him and cut, him, cut them in two, uh, down to the middle and placed each piece opposite the other, but he did not cut the birds in two. And when the vultures came down on the carcasses, Abraham drove them away. Now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abraham, and behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. Then he said to Abraham, God is now speaking to Abraham, listen to this, amazing. Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs and will serve them and they will afflict them 400 years. God is literally prophesying to him, telling him four generations before these things happen, God told him exactly how many years they'll be there and, uh, and what will happen that they will serve them. That means they'll be slaves there and so on. And also the nation whom they serve, I will judge. He also talks about the deliverance of the people of Israel from Egypt. I will judge them. That's what it means. That's deliverance. Afterwards, they shall come out with great possessions. In other words, they'll become poor and uh, they'll be trampled upon. They'll become slaves. But when they come out, they'll come out with great possessions because God will deliver them, bless them and bring them out. And then listen to this. And also then, uh, and now as for you, verse 15, you shall go to your fathers in peace, you shall be buried at a good old age, but in the fourth generation they shall return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. They'll come to the land of Canaan and occupy it. By the time they come, the Canaanites will be ready to be driven out, because they are also very wicked people. And the fact that they were driven out is not some injustice that God did to them. They deserve to be driven out because they were such a horrible bunch, you know, waiting for their iniquity to fill up so that God can judge them. Now listen to this. And it came to pass when the sun went down and it was dark, that behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between these pieces. On the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham saying, to your descendants I have given this land and so on. So, now God made a blood covenant with Abraham. Now, blood covenant in those days is better than writing in a stamp paper and signing, you know. It's more honorable than that. Nobody violated a blood covenant. I've taught about blood covenant here. It's the highest way of making an agreement. Now, God of heaven comes down and makes an agreement, make, makes a covenant with man. The covenant essentially means that the two people making the covenant will look at each other and say, everything that I have is yours. If you need it, you can have it. Both of them will say that. That means, if you need anything, you approach me. You are your descendants. Anybody needs anything, you can always come to me, I'll give that. I will even give my life for you if needed. Because we are covenant partners. Now just imagine what a great deal Abraham got. Abraham got very little to give to God. God got everything to give to Abraham. And this is a wonderful deal. God says, you need anything Abraham, just call upon me and I will be there. I will be your help. I will help you. That's the blood covenant. Now, when the people of Israel, just as it was prophesied, ended up in uh, trouble in the land of Egypt and spent their lifetime, uh, life 400 years in slavery, they cried out to God and God says, in so many words, if you read third chapter of Exodus, God remembered the covenant that he had made with Abraham. And he comes to Moses and introduces himself to Moses saying, I am the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. That means, hey, I'm coming to you on the basis of the covenant, the blood covenant I have made. I'm going to be there in the time of your trouble. I've come here because of that, he says. And uh, so God shows up in the right time, but God has always been working behind the scenes. He is the one that caused Pharaoh's daughter to come and pick up Moses as a little child by that river. The order of the king was that uh, children must be killed if they are found to be boy, uh, when they are born, if the, if the child is found to be a male child, the uh, midwives were told to quietly kill the child. You know, such was the oppression. During those times, somehow Moses' mother gave birth to this child and hid the child in the river and Pharaoh's daughter comes and finds, likes the child, picks it up. All happen in a divinely ordained manner. 
and the mother herself ends up being the um, person to, that, to take care of uh, Moses in the palace. So the mother is raising him, but raising him in the palace at Pharaoh's expense so that one day he can throw Pharaoh and his army in the Red Sea. Now you think about how God is a wonderful God who orchestrates and works everything out so perfectly. God is making Pharaoh pay for the boy that's going to fight against him and throw his whole army in the Red Sea. He's feeding him, sending him to college, educating him, and he's being raised as a king's child in the palace. Now, so don't ever think that God is not at work. When you don't feel, you know, it doesn't mean that God is not there. <laughs> God is always there. God is working behind the scene. So wonderfully, God worked everything out. And now he comes to Moses and appears to him at the burning bush and tells him, go to Pharaoh and tell him, let my people go. And goes, Moses goes and tells him. And Pharaoh says, no, nothing doing. You guys got enough time to go on a vacation. You want to go on a vacation to worship your God. So I'm going to arrange for more work to be given. You're slaves. You don't have any vacation. Work more. So he put them to work and gave them more trouble. So God started sending some plagues because he hardened his heart. The plagues started softly. They were not so harsh. It started softly as he hardened the heart and as he became uh, very hard-hearted, the more the intensity increased in the plague, if you notice. It increases in intensity. But one thing very clear about this, these plagues, the first nine plagues were sent and still Pharaoh hardened his heart and kept hardening his heart more and more. And finally, the tenth plague is going to be the most severe one. Intensity is going to be, is going to peak out now. The most severe one. Now, <laughs> In all these plagues, there was one remarkable thing, and that is the plague affected the life of the Egyptians only, but not the life of the Israelites. Now, God literally drew a line, made a difference between the Egyptians and the Israelites. <laughs> now, this is a wonderful theme in the Bible. I hope I can go into it even more uh, in the days to come. God made a difference between his people and the Egyptians, the oppressors. And he shows how special his people are. And what makes them so special is the covenant, the blood covenant that God had made with Abraham. The blood is what makes them so special. The blood covenant, God remembers that blood. By blood he has shown that he will take care of them. So they are very special, for instance. In one of the plagues, the, uh, uh, Egypt was covered with darkness. Darkness like you've never seen. You can't see your own hand in front of your face. You can't see another person. For three days they spent their lives in their homes not being able to look at one another. Total darkness. But you know in Israelite's house, there was light. I mean even Emirs could not have done such a good job, you know. Simply, all power was cut off in all Egyptians' house and all Israelis had power. They had light in their house. Just imagine. God is literally, God did it with a purpose so that they will see that these people are God's people. God drew a line, said, no, the plague is not going to touch them, not going to affect them. It's going to affect only the Egyptians. This is the way all the plagues went. Now in the final and the tenth plague, this is going to be even more remarkable. God is really going to draw a line. So, and the plague is going to be this kind of plague. That is the firstborn of all Egypt is going, uh, in all Egypt is going to die. Firstborn is going to die. Now, you may say, what a horrible thing. Firstborn dying. Firstborn every, ma uh, of, uh, every uh, male. And then firstborn of all the animals. They're going to die. What a horrible thing. Why, why does your God do something like that? Well, God says, Israel is my firstborn. Now you took my firstborn and made him slave and oppressed him all these years, 430 years. See, whenever God does something, there is tremendous justice in it. There is long suffering in it. There is patience in it. God is never unjust. When God does something, even, even especially when it looks so horrible, you better look and find out why he did it. 
It's unbearable. What these fellows did was unbearable. More. Joseph saved the whole land of Egypt. Is this the way to re repay him and his brothers and their children? Is this the way to pay a man back for saving the land from seven years of famine and raising the land to be one of the most prosperous superpowers in the world? Is this the payback? They did injustice and now it's a time to pay back. You know, there is a God who does justly. God is a righteous judge. And uh, people think that whatever we do today, you know, th th there will be no judgment. Everything will be fine. In the, in the end, everything will... No, in the end, there is going to be judgment for your information. The Bible says, in the end, there is going to be judgment. And even for Christians, the Bible says that everyone will receive according to what they have done. That means even our rewards will be according to what we have done in this life. And... Uh, for, for those who have not received Christ, there is going to be a judgment. The Bible very clearly talks about it. So people live as if there is no judgment, there is no accountability, nobody is going to come and ask us anything and so on. But the Bible gives a different picture. The Bible says that the, our maker, our God holds us accountable. We are accountable to him. He gave us this earth. He gave us the breath of life. He gave us the resources. He gave us a brain. He gave us abilities, talents, gifts. And if we never paid any attention to that and lived according to our own agenda and did whatever we wanted, the one who gave everything, you never brought anything. Paul says, you never brought anything in this world. What is there for you to boast, he says. You never brought anything. You and I never brought anything in this world. Everything that we have comes from God. Therefore, I need to live for the purpose for which God gave me all the gifts and abilities that he's given me and you need to do the same thing so we are accountable to God we need to discover God first come in contact with God first give our lives to God first and ask him what we need to do let him guide us and lead us into the plan and purpose and live for his purpose then only we can stand before him so here is the judgment of God going to happen it sounds horrible but it is God says, Israel is my firstborn. God says in Jeremiah, I am a father to Israel. What a God he is. I am a father to Israel. And Israel is my firstborn, he says. In many ways, the Israelites are firstborn. In what way? To them, first God revealed himself to them. God chose Abraham and revealed it. More than to any man, God revealed himself to Abraham. Abrahamic blessings are a revelation of who God is and what kind of a revelation, or a relationship God wants to have with man. God revealed himself to Abraham in such a way. And, uh, uh, you know, it is, it is so important to understand that, that Israelites are in many ways a firstborn. Ten commandments were given to them. No other nation received any commandment from God. Ten commandments were given to them. Through that, a revelation of God was given to them. They knew God better than any other nation in this earth. That is why when Jesus came, he came to the Jews. He was born as a Jew, among the Jews, lived among them, ministered among them. He said he came to the house of Israel, ministered among them. Salvation is of the Jews, they said. From there only it spread to the Gentiles and others. You first preach in Jerusalem, then Judea, then Samaria, then to the uttermost parts of the world. From the Jews only it spread. So in many ways they are the firstborn. So God says, you took my firstborn and made him a slave and oppressed him, killed him, killed their children and did all kinds of atrocities. Now I'm going to, I'm going to send an angel of death and there is going to be a, uh, there's going to be a death of all the firstborn in Egypt. But before that happened, God wanted to make sure this time the demarcation, line of demarcation is very clearly laid out that the angel of death will clearly know who is God's and who is not. How, are this, how is the angel going to find out? So God says, take a lamb for every house. Every father, the head of the house must take a lamb and kill that lamb, catch that blood in, the, in, a, in a thing and, uh, and uh, take the blood and put it on the doorposts of their house and sit inside the house under the protection of the blood. When the angel of death comes midnight, he will pass over that house where the blood is smeared on the doorpost. The blood then becomes a sign, is used as a 
sign to tell who is an Egyptian and who is an Israelite. The blood is used as a sign. Now, this is a very important teaching. The Bible teaches so much about salvation through this event. The sign of the blood was to be placed on the door. The angel is not going to see whether that person is good or bad. Not going to stop by and check out his character. Check out his record. Check out his face. No. He is not even going to check out whether he is an Israelite or Egyptian. No. If the door has blood, the angel will pass over you. That shows us something wonderful. And that is, the Israelites are not better than the Egyptians. They are just as much sinners as G Egyptians. The way the difference is made between the two is, that Israelites' house had the blood on the door. Egyptians' house did not have the blood on the door. The revelation about the blood on the door was given only to the Israelites. They had the blood on the door. Amazing. Think of us. We are not God's children today because we were born in a decent family and we've been pretty good people and lived morally upright and therefore God said, all right, come in, you can be my child. No. We were just as much sinners as everyone else in the world. We were just as much unworthy as everyone is in the world. But God, by His grace, has given His Son for us and His blood has been shed and gracefully He has revealed it to us and we have confessed Him as our Lord and Savior and taken that blood and sprinkled it upon our hearts, cleansing our hearts and our conscience and made us whole. And that is why we are saved today. It is for no other reason. There is basically no other difference between us and others other than the fact that the blood is sprinkled upon us. Now, <clears throat> why it is the blood and nothing else? Because of sin. Nothing else can be a sign. The blood has to be the sign because Israel, uh, Israelites are sinners just like the Egyptians. The only thing that protects them is the blood of the Lamb because God has ordained that uh, sin must be remedied with the shedding of blood and that is why the blood is the sign. All right. So that is why Paul talks about the Passover Lamb in that way. He says, Christ our Passover has been sacrificed for us. He literally takes the Passover event and says, Our Passover happened when Jesus died on the cross. Just like for those people that was a remarkable day, that day of Passover observance was a remarkable day because that day they observed Passover, they sprinkled the blood on the door, sat inside until the destruction, destroying angel came and destroyed the firstborn of every house. And then they got out from there and left and journeyed and were set free from that day forever from the bondage of Egypt. That was a major event. No Israelite that has gone through that will ever forget. And Paul says, Christ our Passover has been sacrificed for us. Now, for a Christian, the cross is a very major event. Very major thing. If you are truly a Christian, if you have... If you have if you're born again, if you, don't, if you know what salvation means and what the cross means and what the shed blood means to you, you can never think of it in an ordinary way. It is the most extraordinary thing for a Christian. All right? God says, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. That's how the word pass over came. In the, Jesus in heaven today is known as the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God is a term that signifies what he did as the lamb on the Passover day. All right. So the Bible finds that as a very important thing to understand. So the Passover teaches about the kind of... Uh, the, the Passover teaches us many things. The Passover teaches that the deliverance was bought, brought about through the blood of Jesus. That's the great lesson that the Passover teaches. And I want to just mention some of the things that the Passover event shows. Just one by one let me mention, and I want to emphasize a couple of things very strongly here. A couple of, couple of uh, things uh, I want to spend some time on. But I want to mention other things, and other things are most obvious, so I won't spend too much time on it. First of all, the deliverance was brought about or planned by God himself. 
the deliverance was planned by god and it's not man's uh, finding or discovery the deliverance the method of deliverance was not man's it is not that men put together a committee to come up with a problem to solve the sin problem of man this is not something that you can uh, sit down in a lab and figure out this is not something that you can sit down in a board room and come to a conclusion about how to solve this human problem now we human beings are good at solving many problems but this is a very special problem only god can plan the deliverance from sin and satan egypt and the bondage of egypt is a shadow of the bondage of people in sin uh, and uh, f- uh, and and uh, bondage of satan you see people are in bondage to satan and bondage to sin and the israelites being in slavery in egypt under pharaoh oppressed under pharaoh was a picture of that and deliverance from that is a picture of how god delivers from sin and satan so it's a deliverance from sin and satan it's not a very ordinary thing now you can go to university and study all kinds of subjects now there are some subjects that i had never heard about in my day you know some new new subjects have come you know but have you do you know of any university that offers a subject on sin you know no university can teach on sin i wonder if they even believe on it they won't teach a subject on sin they won't teach a subject on redemption because this is something a subject that is totally different no university knows anything about it they can solve all kinds of problems they can they can come up with solutions but not this one but cause this is a problem that man does not even comprehend very well what is the sin problem the sin problem is a very deep deep rooted problem man is puzzled by it even the apostle paul says the thing that i want to do i am not able to do here is an educated man he is not lacking in education he was born and raised in a well to do family and uh, raised well religiously he is not a outright sinner or was not raised uh, in that way he was raised in a pretty decent family in a religious way he studied under some of the greatest religious teachers of his day and had the highest of education from the best of educational institutions of that day here is the most educated man and he says in romans 7 he says there's something wrong inside of me i don't understand this who can deliver me from this wretched state he says exactly that's how he puts it what did he find in himself he finds an inability he finds that he is a is enslaved by a alien power some other power is ruling over me how does he know because the very thing that i want to do i'm not able to do he says you read chapter 7 of romans is the most interesting chapter the thing that i want to do i'm not able to do the thing that i don't want to do i end up doing and then he says about the law of god the law of god is good holy nothing wrong with the law of god i know it i've studied it but i'm not able to do it something has gone wrong with me sin is in me he says i have identified what that problem is the problem is sin he says sin is in me i'm ruled by a power called the power of sin who can deliver me finally he came to the conclusion about who the deliverer is and who the savior is he says thank be to god through jesus christ he says it is through jesus christ that god delivers that's what he's saying jesus christ is the deliverer so every person the most decent person the most educated person you know sometimes not everybody does murder and lies and steals and cheats and not everybody most people are decent people and some, some some people are very educated very refined and they behave nicely and so on they don't do anything outright wrong you know they don't go out and do things bad things you'll find many people like that in the world they just don't go out and do wrong things but the question here is not about whether you have done anything wrong the question is what kind of a power do you feel is ruling over you even the best people who have not done anything wrong will tell you 
even though I've not done anything wrong. See, people don't do things wrong because there's a lot of restrictions. There's a lot of uh, things that keeps them from doing wrong, right? From the time we go to school, there is called moral instruction class. So they kind of bring us into line. They tell us, don't cheat, don't lie, don't do this, don't. So we hear this and we, in our house also they keep telling us and, and so on. All this, this type of moral instruction is given in every home, in all religions, in all ways of life and so on. This moral instruction is given. So we are, we are pretty good in that. So we know that decent living means that you have to behave. And then there is police. So if you do wrong, they'll catch you. So you don't want to be caught. For some people there is police in the house itself. <laughs> Wife is there, husband is there and, and so on. So there's a lot of reasons why people don't do wrong. They feel, you know, that they'll be ashamed if they did wrong and if they were ever caught and so on. So a lot of these things keep them pretty decent, you know, they don't do wrong. That doesn't mean that they don't want to do wrong. Ah, that's where it is. That doesn't mean there is nothing wrong in them. The fact that they have never done anything wrong doesn't mean they, you know, they have no capacity to do wrong or they, they have no inclination to do, do wrong. In fact, I will say to you, they have inclination and they have a drive to do wrong which they find very hard to keep under check. They're having trouble to keep that thing down. This drive to do wrong, to do to some kind of a sinful thing. They got to watch out, they got to be very careful, they got to guard themselves because this thing is driving them from inside. Sometimes they find that power overwhelming. Anybody that speaks the truth will tell you that. You can contact the best God men. You can contact guys who are very religious, meditating all the time and uh, doing all these things, they'll say, yeah, that's the problem. That's why I'm meditating all the time, you know. I'm trying to get away from that evil thing, you know. That, try, that thing is trying to get me, overcome me. This is a problem for me. That's why I'm trying to get away from this world. Get into the woods and get where nobody is and no temptation is. I want to get away from all the temptations of this world because this thing is driving me from inside. There is a power. That is the power called sin. Because this is such a mysterious power, a power that is not commonly understood by everybody and people know nothing about this power, know very little about this power, they cannot find a solution to this power. Only God can find a solution to this power because only God knows what kind of power this is. That is why God plans salvation. That is why God only can plan salvation. Man cannot plan his salvation. So the Passover was all planned by God. Now they are already used to sacrifices, I said to you, right? From the days of coats of skin in the Garden of Eden. They are already used to sacrifice. Sacrifice is not a new thing. They have shed blood. They understand if you sin, blood must be shed. Sin results in loss of life. Sin results in this kind of thing. Then only remedy can come. All of that they have understood, right? So, in order to come and stand before God, Abel understood he's got to come with a sacrifice that God will accept. He will accept only in terms of the blood sacrifice. That is why he came with the blood sacrifice. That much they knew, that to come and stand before God, I must admit that I'm a sinner, that I must give a substitute to die in my place, which shows that I am standing before God and saying, Lord, I acknowledge I'm a sinner. Let my sin be laid upon this animal, let it die. Please have mercy on me. That's what the meaning of sacrifice is. But now the revelation is getting higher, bigger. With the Passover, the revelation is getting bigger. It is not, it is not people trying to stand before God. People are under oppression of Pharaoh. They are in slavery. They are in chains. They are slaves of Egypt. They are being oppressed. They are under the power of this terrible enemy. Now they have to be delivered. It's not the issue of whether they can stand before God or not. God already loves them. God has made a covenant with Abraham. He's come down. He's reaching out to them to deliver them. It's not a matter of whether they can stand before God now. It is a matter of whether God can deliver them now. 
deliver them from this wretched enemy this terrible enemy that's been oppressing them keeping them under his thumb so they're learning something new about the blood i will say to you they have understood the blood as something that qualifies them before god that god accepts anyone that comes and says yeah i've sinned i must die and i bring this substitute because i acknowledge that i am a sinner let my death be placed upon the god understands that that's the way they came but now the passover lamb is not just for that the passover lamb is about some further things something beyond that the passover lamb is about god delivering the people protecting the people delivering the people protecting the people not only from the judgment that came upon all egypt but protecting the people from the evil that pharaoh wants to do to, do to these people now turn with me to exodus chapter 11 when god gave this whole instruction about passover he tells them see just imagine see when you read the old testament stories like this because we are so far removed in time and space and culture and so on you need to imagine being in their position suppose you were a slave your father was a slave your grandfather was a slave last four generations you've been slaves what a slave mentality would come in just imagine you know just see what what kind of mental condition you'll be in and if a man like moses comes and says come on let's ready, get ready be packed and ready to go we're going to get out of this land you know what i will say if i was that slave and my granddaddy and great granddaddy was a slave and that's the only thing i've known i'd say moses are you sure don't be playing with us already we are having too much work the last time you uh, you went to him and told him that we want to go and worship our god for few days he increased our work pharaoh said you got time for vacation i'll give you more work that's what happened last time don't spoil our life man get away from us because if we believed you and if we think that we can just pack up and leave this place you are fooling us because pharaoh has got horses chariots army everything we are just shepherds we got a few sheep that's all we got we, we are not warriors we can't run that enemy is a mighty enemy he is a super power he will pursue us he will catch us he will bring us back i am not coming with you i won't come with you because this guy is too much we can't just go, just walk away from him that's a, that's what a normal slave would have said so they have to be guaranteed a lot they have to be given they have to be given a lot of guarantees and assurances and so on and uh, so the what i'm trying to point out is the blood here is revealed as a very powerful thing that will not just help man to stand before god that is another issue to stand the sinner to come and stand before god it is something more the blood is so powerful that it will effect a deliverance from the clutches and the chains of the enemy from the power of sin and from the power of satan and protect the child of god and take him all the way to the end that is the revelation of the blood that is given here that's why it's very special not just for my forgiveness of sins not just for my acceptance before god but the blood will literally deliver me snatch me away Amen. from the hand of satan and take me every step of the way and be with me every day and lead me and guide me and help me to walk in victory and reach till the end the blood is so powerful that from the day that i am marked by the blood nobody will be able to lay their hands on me that i will walk under god's protection i am belong to god i am a blood bought one and he guarantees that my journey will be safe that is the thing that is guaranteed here the revelation is significantly progressed here the bible is a progressive love revelation you may have heard of, heard of that it begins slowly and increases more and more so the revelation concerning the blood is given significantly more here so let's read 117 exodus 117 this is instructions given but guarantees also are given because people won't just pack up and leave they are need to be told nothing to worry about so moses says this in verse 
no verse 5 onwards and all the first born in the land of egypt shall die from the first born of pharaoh who sits on his throne even to the first born of the female servant who is behind the handmill and all the first born of the animals from pharaoh to the ordinary person i tell the tamil people parvon indirundu paamaran varai that's the way from the king to the pauper beggar everybody the first born must die then there shall be a great cry throughout all the land of egypt such as was not like it before nor shall be like it again never heard like that before never seen like that before never will be seen or heard like that again such cry will go forth throughout the land of egypt he says then look at this but against none of the children shall a dog move its tongue <laughs> how do you like that against none of the children of israel shall a dog move its tongue against man or beast that you may know that the lord does make a difference between the egyptians and israel <laughs> these people were slaves all this time yeah. and now the lord is telling moses listen not even a dog not even a dog will move its tongue against any man or beast so that you may know that israel is very special they are the blood bought ones they belong to god god has come to claim them that no tongue will rise up against them not one person will have the boldness and the courage to stop you from moving out packing out and leaving not one person will lay their, their hands on you in other words he's guaranteeing says never forget about laying hands on you they won't even use their tongue against you that's the way i'll deal with them he says the whole thing will change he says the power of the blood of the lamb Amen. god guarantees them he says not even a dog not even a dog shall move its tongue against a man or beast that you may know that the lord does make a difference everybody say that lord does make a difference you know do you know you are so special <laughs> not because you are so good <laughs> not because we are so good do you know that we are all so special in the sight of god not because we are so good we are so better than others because we are blood marked because of his grace because of the blood of jesus because of god's great love and god's great grace we are special that's why one singer sang it like this andre crouch sang it many years ago like this i don't know why jesus loved me i don't know why he cared why so much love why would god reach out to me why would god consider me so special i don't know why Oh but I know that he did. Amen. That's all I know. I don't know why. Nothing special. I'm just as much a sinner as anybody. But oh all I know is he loved me. And he has marked me with his blood. He has been gracious to me. That's the way salvation is presented in the word of God. So God plans the salvation. God plans the salvation and one of the remarkable thing in this whole event is that constantly god makes a difference between his people and others on the basis of the blood it started way back there when the blood was shed blood of the lamb was shed and the la- and the blood was applied on the door that day it became a token the word token is used in the english language english bible in chapter 12 shall be a token to you he said it shall be a sign verse 13 that we read says in chapter 12 It's a sign it's a token it's a symbol it's an emblem to know that these are israelites not egyptians it started being used as an emblem and a sign but it did not last only that day thereafter they are known as the blood marked people that no one could stand against them that's the way they were <laughs> so i say to you If you believed in Jesus as your Lord and Savior if you believed that Jesus died for you he shed his blood for you and you have confessed him as your Lord and Savior and taken 
the faith in that blood and confessed it. It's like taking the blood and sprinkling it in your doorposts of your heart. If you've done it, I'll tell you, my friend, you are under God's protection and care and loving kindness. You live under that all the days of your life. That day you begin that journey like that. But it does not end. That work of the blood does not end with that one day. That is what the Passover shows. That is why they were told to observe it. Last time, last week we saw that they were told to observe it every year as an ordinance. They had to make a big celebration out of it. They had to teach it to their children. They had to do it, enact it all over again. Why? Because it was not to be forgotten. It is not just a past event. It is a present reality. They are the blood-bought people. They are under the blood. That's the reality. All right. So the first thing is God planned and God planned and schemed the deliverance. And the deliverance happened through the blood of Jesus. The second is the deliverance is through substitution. The word substitution means that in our place, someone else died. For us, someone else died. In Paul's epistles, there are certain words that come repeatedly again and again. The word in, in Christ and so on. For us, through Christ and so on. All of these words have tremendous meaning. The, every time when he talks about for us, he's talking about substitution. How Jesus died for us. All right. Now, Jesus became our substitute. We needed to die, but in our place, he died. When on the day of Passover, the first Passover, there was death in every house in Egypt, including the Israelite houses. Some people say, no, there was death in Egyptian houses, but not in Israelite houses. No, no, no. Think about it. In every house, there was death. In Israelite house and Egyptian house. The difference is, in the Israelite's house, the Israelite did not die. A substitute died for him. That's the glory of the whole thing. Instead of the Israelite dying, God provided a substitute. When Abraham took his son Isaac to offer on the, on the altar up on the Mount Moriah, God meets him there and stops him from killing the son and says, no, 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 Abraham. There is a substitute. I've got a, I've got a substitute ready. I wanted to show you that I have got a substitute in mind. Lamb slain from before the foundation of the world. My son Jesus Christ is going to become the substitute. I wanted to teach you that. In the same mountain, my son will be offered as the sacrifice one day. There is a substitute. Don't kill your son. I gave your son. At 100 years of age, I gave your son. In your son rests all the promises. He's got a great future. But my son will die in your son's place. And in the place of everyone, there is a substitute. The idea of substitutionary sacrifice. That's why that place was named Jehovah Jireh. It means Lord will see to it. That means God will make sure there's a substitute. God saw to it that there was some sacrifice that can be prepared for us so that we don't die, so that we don't get destroyed, so that we don't end up in hell, so that we don't uh, get punished for eternally, so that we can escape. On the day of judgment, God found a substitute and that substitute is Jesus Christ. Thirdly, the deliverance is by means of the sprinkling of the blood. Not only did the animal die, the blood was sprinkled, showing that it's not enough that Jesus died on the cross. Jesus died on the cross for everybody. But so many did not sprinkle the blood upon their hearts. So many did not take that blood and apply it to themselves. It doesn't happen automatically. The Bible teaches it wonderfully through the Passover. The sprinkling of the blood is an important thing. The, the most important thing in that is the sprinkling of the blood. If you did everything, if you cut the lamb and shed the blood and everything and made the unleavened bread and were ready to eat and you were packed and ready to go but didn't sprinkle the blood on the door, finished, you won't be traveling that day. There's nowhere to go. you would be a dead person, you know. The sprinkling is the most important thing. Last week I told you a story of an old man was the firstborn and he had a firstborn son living with this firstborn son and that son had a firstborn son right 
three people would die in that house normally. So that old man, I showed you how, if I was that old man, how careful I would be. <laughs> Not a joke. I'll be busy going looking for the lamb without blemish. I'll make sure I get the right one. I'll make sure the lamb's blood is shed properly and I'll make sure these boys applied it properly, you know. I won't be sitting reading my paper and saying, son, make sure you just put some on the door there, you know. No, 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 I will get up myself in my old age. I will make sure for my sake, for his sake, for his son's sake, for my descendant's sake, I will get up ten times, I will go and look at the door. Is it all right? Everything is fine. Have you done it? Is it done properly? Hello, are you sure you have done it for yourself? Have you checked your household, seen that everybody is under the blood? Have you led them to Christ? Have you told them about this God's plan of salvation? Have you made sure as a man of the house, you are, you are to make sure that you bring them in, you shut the door, you make sure that the blood is on the door, you make sure that Christ is the Lord of your house. So the deliverance is by the sprinkling of blood. Also, the deliverance is through faith and obedience. Obe faith is obedience. The obedience of faith is very important, you see. They've never done that before. This is a novelty. They've shed blood and they've sacrificed animals. But they've never done it this way. They've never smeared anything on the door and, and they didn't have to go through all these things. And they didn't have to go through these things to deliver them from the hand of a mighty man like Pharaoh. They've just come to God before and sacrificed some animal and shed the blood to indicate they are sinners and they've got a substitute. But this is something new. This they are doing so that this can be a source of their deliverance. They have never done that anymore, any, uh, ever before. And this is a very hard thing to do because to be delivered from the hands of Pharaoh by just the blood, by the shedding of blood, not only delivered from the angel of death, but it's a two-edged deliverance. Angel of death will pass over you, but then Egyptians will not be able to touch you also. You are packed and ready to go. No dog will ever wag its tongue against you, God says. So, this is something new and novel, and they still did it, and by faith they did it. Next thing is, it brought immediate deliverance. It brought immediate deliverance. Why immediate deliverance is possible? See, you don't have to wait. You don't have to do some religious thing here and there. And you don't have to fast for 10 days, you know, and, and pray and do this and do that and all that. I remember I went to a youth meeting many, many years ago when I was a youth. That's a long time ago. <laughs> we went up this mountain and, uh, and traveled there and went there. And boy, they, they just preached and preached and preached. They wanted to make sure everybody was saved and so on. So, I tried to get saved so many times, you know. I just didn't know what head or tail about saved, you know. I wanted to get saved somehow. So, every time they preached, it looked like I was not saved, you know. So, I would raise my hands and I'd just go and stand there and I went and stood there. But the man said, you know, this is not very easy. Next three days, you fast and pray. Next three days, fast and pray. Now, I was a young man, I didn't fast even one time, you know. <laughs> just fasting just one meal was such a difficult thing to me, to tell you the truth, you know. I remember on Good Friday, they used to have kanji and tovel, you know, <laughs> chutney in my house. And I will go and eat in some restaurant, most likely, <laughs> you know. I was just a typical young man. I just didn't know anything about fasting. But here I went to the meeting. They said, you fast and pray for three days. And then God will show you all the sins. And then you get the list from God. He will show you like on a TV screen, you know. Those days we didn't even have a TV. We, 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 you know, we've only seen it in movies and stuff, you know, that uh, these Americans and others having TV. God will show it on a screen. TV screen like thing. And then you find out all your sins. Then you confess all your sins. And then you feel the remorse and you cry and you, three days you pray. After that you come, then we will see. 
Nothing like that here. Once the blood was shed and it was sprinkled on the doorpost, he told them to go sit there and eat, in fact. Read the chapter 12. <laughs> he said, eat the unleavened bread <laughs> as a symbol of how your new life has begun. Leaven has to do with the old. When you take the old dough and add it with the new, the whole thing becomes leavened, right? So unleavened bread means fresh, freshly made. So God says, go and don't even eat any unleavened, uh, don't even eat any leavened bread. Unleavened bread only. Why? Because you are freshly made. You're going to have a new life. No more a slave anymore. You're no more under bondage. You don't have to fear Pharaoh. You are a child of God. You're under God's protection. You're under his care. This is a new life. Amen. That month was to be the first month of their year. The Passover. Marks the first month of their year. That's when their year begins. Have you seen some people will say, I'm only 10 years old, but they're 50 years old. Then they'll say, I was born again 10 years ago. They only take that into account. Well, that'll, that's a good idea because that'll reduce my age by a significant <laughs> many years, you know. But that's when you really started living because that's the first day of your real living and real life when you were born again. God said to them, that will be the first month of your year. Your religious calendar, mark it. This is the first month. This is when it starts. The Passover marks the beginning. Eat the unleavened bread because you are freshly made. Old things are gone. Slavery is gone. Fear is gone. Lowliness is gone. Terror is gone. You are into a new life. So that's the sixth thing. The blood is the beginning of a new life. If you read Exodus chapter 12 verse 14 to 20, it talks about the feast of the unleavened bread. They need to eat the unleavened bread on the Passover day and then for seven days. They celebrated it as a feast every year later on. It is so closely connected with the feast of the Passover. Why? Because it marks the fresh new life that you begin. So the blood marks the beginning of a new life. All right. The other seventh thing is this. The blood gave assurance. The blood gives assurance of the love and guidance and the continuing protection of God throughout their lives. This is a very important aspect. The blood not only saves them on that day when they got out of Egypt, not only just delivered them. See, many people interpret it only in that way. They were just delivered by the blood of the Lamb on that day. That's it. No more. No. The blood gave them the assurance that all is well, that God will continue to love and guide and protect them throughout their journey because their dangers did not end in Egypt. They were in danger there. Pharaoh wanted them there. He wanted them to continue as slaves there. God delivered them by the power of the blood. But it did not end there. The danger did not end there. When they came out, as a whole nation lacks and lacks of people, here is three million people coming down the road and then on, uh, in front of them is the sea. Behind them is Pharaoh pursuing. He changed his mind again. After all that happened to him, he changed his mind again. He wanted to pursue and make, bring them back. So, because he's losing some cheap labor, you know. So he's pursuing them. So in the front there is sea. If you go forward, you die in the sea. If you turn backward, you die in the hands of Pharaoh. Moses cries out to God and says, God, what shall I do? God says, stretch forth your hand and split the sea into two. So that the people can walk over. <sighs> Didn't God say, the Lord God will show that there is a difference between you and the Egyptians? Now he's, that is not over with Egypt and with the event of the Passover. That is not just for the Passover event. He said, I'll show that there is a difference between you and the Egyptians. I'll draw a line. You're special. No dog will wag its tongue against you, he said. But that is not just a guarantee for that event, that day of Passover. It is a guarantee that continues to be in effect. So God says, stretch forth your hands. And he stretched forth his hand. The sea split into two. And the people just walked over. Amazing. 
people just walked over to the other side and when pharaoh's army tried to walk over by the same way it closed up why because there's a difference what is the difference they are blood marked they were marked way back in egypt blood marked that is not just for that one day the protection continues the guarantee continues the mark of the blood is on them it was on the door but it is on them right now god says these are the people that came under the blood i'm going to be with them i'm going to take them then they come into the wilderness and here they need food no market to buy anything nowhere to eat with 3 million people where would you go for for you know where will you go and buy for 3 million people i can imagine what kind of problem will be there i took 50 students one time and went to some villages to do some work and i took all 50 of them to have lunch one place the guy said no sir for this many people we don't have food this is a small village <laughs> he's never seen 50 people come to the restaurant at the same time no maybe 15 people 20 people all right but 50 people you have to wait for a couple of hours before we can get ready just imagine moses going with 30 lakhs people 3 million people no where to buy anything nothing there and god says don't worry i'm here to provide for you and he provides manna from heaven they wanted water he provides water out of the rock because the blood that was shed and marked them on that day marked them forever they are the blood bought ones the guarantee that the blood will protect was not just for that one day it is a mark forever that is why they were to hold that forever as a celebration and teach their children the significance of this because it is not just for that one day it is a mark forever upon them then there were enemies in the wilderness also some of the nations around them started hearing about these people marching and they heard about the red sea splitting and god doing all these wonderful things bringing manna from heaven water from the rock and all that they got scared you know these fellows will come and drive us out they're danger to us this new nation is marching and coming so one fellow went and got a literally a witchcraft fellow like you know to curse them he paid money and he said come i want you to curse the people here and he took them to took him to a mountain and that fellow stood at the top of the mountain and he was all ready to curse because the money is big the king is paying him you know and he stood there and he looked at the people of israel camped in the wilderness and he wanted to curse he opened his mouth the words are not coming <laughs> when he opened his mouth the words to curse were not coming why because of the power of the blood Amen. the blood that was shed and marked them on that day god said no dog will even wag its tongue <laughs> certainly this is the guy god meant i think <laughs> he didn't mean a dog dogs are very kind <laughs> he meant this dog here <laughs> no dog will ever wag its tongue and this dog tried he couldn't and second time the fellow said let's offer more sacrifices let's off let's do this and let's go to the other side from there you'll have a better view so he took him to the other side of the mountain from there he looked there also he's not able to go third time he took him somewhere and from there he looked one great bible scholar says that people were camped according to god's instruction the 12 camps camped Uh, in this way four to the north four to the south four to the east and four to the west but god specified which tribe on which side and the numbers differed each tribe some tribe was bigger than the other and so on so you know these guys that do research and all they figure out you know they draw a picture and try to fit in all the people you know how many lakhs of people in each tribe and they fit in try to get a picture of how it looked like and this guy says that if you look from the mountain top down in the wilderness where the people are camped all over the place according to god specified uh, way four tribes on each uh, direction all you will see is a big cross it seems from there only that fellow says 
he talks he literally opens his mouth and only a prophecy about the cross is coming i don't have the time to read it you go and read, read balaam's prophecy he says oh my god i'm seeing a different picture now from whatever direction he looks that's what he can see only the cross and he could not curse so i say to you that god has provided the blood as a mark upon them on that day but it is to last forever to protect them and to be with them and to guide them and show his continuing love for them finally the blood is the pledge that just like god delivered them from egypt he will also bring them into the promised land a land where they will come into all the blessings of god and live in the fullness of god's blessing god wants each and every one of you to come into the promised land what is the promised land life in christ all the blessings that are in christ god wants you to come into the promised land possess everything that he has promised how remember that you will not be a good possessor of everything in the promised land if you forget the blood it is through the blood that you started the journey it is the blood that will take you in remember jericho and rahab that woman that lived on the wall of jericho when the wall fell she had already received a guarantee from the jewish spies <laughs> she told them you save me and my my family when you guys come in you'll destroy everything you'll win but save me save my family save my assets so she's sitting on the wall her house is on the wall and they tied a, you know she asked the guarantee what guarantee will you give me give me a token that you will save me when you come you're going to destroy everybody will you save me give me a token and the guys thought about it they said well what token to give and they could only remember the blood and they don't have time to shed the blood and put the blood and all that they said take that ribbon over there <laughs> take that thread over there let's tie it on the window so that when we see that we will not touch this house they came in they did not knock the wall down they just went around seven times on the seventh day and shouted when god told them to shout and the wall fell like i said archaeologists say that the wall fell but one little part stood and it could very well be rahab's house they say amazingly that house was protected that's how they entered into the promised land so entering into the promised land possessing the blessings of god living in god's blessing is all by the blood of jesus so the blood of jesus is not just for your forgiveness of sin it is for your whole christian life and one thing one thing about one thing about being born as a pentecostal and raised in a pentecostal is this one advantage we knew about the blood of jesus very well i've seen it work so many times in so many ways from many dangers we were saved and many good things we have experienced i remember one time i picked up my grandmother who had something like in her hip you know i went and picked her up because she was terribly sick and uh, put her in the car and i looked at her sides it was like somebody cut her with a knife four or five times you know it was like sliced you know opened completely i've never seen anything like that i said let me stop at a doctor's place she doesn't believe in doctors you know old pentecostal so she doesn't go to doctors no medicines nothing i said let me talk, stop at a doctor's place you don't have to step in i'll call the doctor he'll come and look and tell me whether you live or die you know my father was not in town so he i st- i stopped there and she said get thee behind me satan you know <laughs> no doctor <laughs> so i drove her home what to do i couldn't take her to do- i don't know what sign kind of sickness this was and so on she came home sat in a cart she said bring me that coconut oil brought the coconut oil she will take the coconut oil she said yesu in ratham jayam that means there's victory in the blood of jesus and she will apply that and i thought she'll say it again and again and again as a young man i thought my god you know you need to go to doctor come on you know she said that but five days she kept all day doing that five six days everything dried up everything is well everything is okay the next week everything is completely gone you know she was fine 
Till this day we don't know what it was, but she lived seven, eight years after that. <laughs> so that is one of the good things about being a Pentecostal. <laughs> there are many good things. One fellow told me when I was young, he said, always when you hear teaching, take the bone, I mean take the meat, eat the meat and spit out the bones. A lot of bones also there. My, for example, my grandmother will not look at a mirror, will not use a comb and all that stuff. You can't use any perfume. All that is bones. I spit it out a long time ago. <laughs> I use all that. <laughs> but there is some meat. There is a meat. I never spit out the meat. I like the meat. And the meat is these kinds of things. The blood of Jesus is one of the most valuable truths I have learned coming from that background. And the power of the blood of Jesus is so wonderfully taught in those circles. And I've seen so many victories by simply opening my mouth and confessing the power of the blood of Jesus in my situations, in dangerous times, in times of trouble and distress. <laughs> Shall we all stand together? Let's lift up our hands and give thanks to God. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we come. Thank you, Lord, for this great truth, this wonderful truth. I pray that it will go into the hearts of people, that they will experience in real life the power of the blood of Jesus that will keep them safe, that will protect them, that will save them from danger, from every work of the enemy. They are blood-marked people. And I pray that they will take what the blood has done and what the word of God says that the blood has done and confess it every day and speak it forth every day that the blood will bring a power in their life and a victory in their life they've never seen before in their lives, oh God. May they walk in victory just like the people of God with great confidence that God is with them. We give you all the glory and honor and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit abide with each and every one of us for now and forevermore. Amen.